Anyone have any strong opinions on stage presence to get us started? I'm not really sure if anyone here does. Uh, I have a hot take. What's your hot take? There is such a thing as too much stage presence. Yes, but I don't think that's an issue the majority of local people have to worry about. Well, so we had like loosely discussed this. And one thing to like take into account with stage presence as a concept is stage presence goes into audible as well as visual. So what you say on stage counts as stage presence. If you talk between songs and you just quick ad lib it, there's some people who like get away with that really well with like how their music rolls, but also still kind of boring. There's the planned ad libbing it. Like Alpha Andromeda, for example. Dude, they do that perfectly where it is exactly... They program the computer to say what they want and the computer matches their aesthetic with every member of basically a... It gives me the energy. I mean, Alpha Andromeda, Star Systems, all that. They're in a rocket ship and it's like a pre-programmed AI computer running through the steps of the launch system kind of deal. And then they're just the people adding the components. But even then, they're like bands who like plan what they're going to say between things. And then there's bands who plan what they say between things, but they don't take into account where they're playing at all. And they say stupid things that can blatantly be seen are not part of what their audience is feeling. If you say split the pit, let me see you move left to right. Everyone get a get up in here. And there's like three middle-aged people in the back with cocktails and two kids in the front, you're literally just asking two kids to run into each other. That's not going to be fun for anyone. I mean, you can ask two kids to run into each other as long as you're self-aware about it. Yeah, be like you right there and you right there. Like, y'all are turning up. Like, let me see you run into each other. Don't ask for a wall of death. Punch him in the fucking face. Yeah, ask for like, I want to see an MMA fight right now in the pit, like right on the floor. You too, like that kind of energy. But if you just have like a baseline, like crowd interaction you want to do, and then you don't actually ever look at the crowd, that makes it uncomfortable for everybody. Oh yeah. Like back in my, my younger days, aka two years ago, I used to be like, I would try to help out local bands who like added those directions. And I'm at a point where like, why am I doing this? I paid money to be here. Why am I making myself uncomfortable to make you the artist happy? Shouldn't you be like looking at what's going to make us feel the most happy? And sometimes it's like walking into a shop with nobody in the shop. You want the shop owner to say hi and then not to follow you around. As a musical artist, say hi to them. Don't like try to ride them or direct them if there's not very many people. Now, if you have a passionate crowd, that's different. And you can normally tell by the second track whether or not they are going to be that passionate crowd. Oh, yeah. It's like being a conductor with, like, one person in front of you versus a conductor with a whole orchestra. You can tell that one person what to do. It's still not going to be as good as them just doing what they could do alone. You need a conductor when there's an orchestra. It's supposed to be a crowd interaction. It's a two-way exchange. If the artist isn't reading the audience and able to tailor their performance even slightly to whatever audience is happening then it's not crowd interaction. It's artificial crowd interaction. And not intentionally artificial, like Alpha Andromeda. The main thing is, as far as stage presence and why people should care about it at all, your experience of music includes the total experience of everything around you. If your antics take away from the music, if it makes you seem like a person who's not self-aware is going to make your music seem more superficial, no matter how good the music is, it's the exact same as having a conversation with another person. If you go up to someone at a party and are talking at them and they don't seem to be reacting to what you're saying, don't just keep trying to... That's like the equivalent of saying, why are you being so awkward, man? Like, just loosen up. Like, that's not going to do anything. Like, be an aware person and look at, like, what part of me talking to them is the reason they're not being active right now. And what do I need to do to actually get them to be active? Because pointing it out makes them want to, like, just leave. If I'm standing still in the back with a drink and I hear a musician call me out for standing there having a good time in the back with my drink, 
Yeah, I'm out of there. Now, if you, this isn't what you want me to be having a good time, I'm going to go have a good time out in the back alley, like throw myself into a puddle or something, hanging out with a stray dog. Like there's so many different options you could have. Yeah, it's a conversation. Don't be over exertive in your conversation. If the crowd's not giving you what you want, that's why there's other musicians on stage with you who ideally share the same passion you do. And this is what jazz musicians learned in the mid 20th century is if you start making music that people don't want to dance to, that doesn't matter. They're just going to kind of pop off on their own, feed off each other's energy. And that's how jazz evolved from a dance music into art music. They learn to read each other. Music for the musicians. Just ask yourself, why isn't the audience moving how I want them to? You can get two people to move how you want them to. It's just, you might have not had two people as your plan going into it. But think about it, and think about it doing the thing you're up on stage to do. They didn't pay money to come to your show to hear you talk. They paid money to hear music. How can you do your music and present your music that makes people act how you want them to act? And how can what you vocalize between musical acts enhance the vibe that you are trying to portray with the music and keep it rolling? Get an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Maybe not necessarily, even though they are going to hear music, but primarily they're there to be entertained, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, what can, what can you add to the performance that will enhance the entertainment and not just be... Something I feel like I got to do because I'm on stage. We're in the entertainment industry. All right. It's like being a, like being a parent. <laughs> you know, it's like you have so much responsibility that it cannot all be about yourself. You need to be the bigger man as an artist. Yeah. It's like, of course, what you're playing is going to reflect your own interests and your own things, but... As for the people, you know, it doesn't matter what they're going to listen to as long as you're feeling it to the point that whatever you give them is going to be the best thing that they'll ever see, you know. Give them impeccable vibes. And by vibes, I don't mean just like you feeling it yourself in your head. about to say there's a difference between acting a fool and acting foolish. And there's a certain level of tomfoolery that's necessary to bring the crowd in because it is a performance at the end of the day. You want to keep them entertained. But if you look like a fool, rather than someone who is acting foolish, it can deter a lot of people from your music and add to this feeling of disingenuity, mm -hmm. if that's a word. Well, do you say it's better to act the fool or to act foolish? I'd say it's better to act a fool. I'd say it's better to act a fool than to act unaware of the energy that the crowd is giving off. Because while I have heard some acts say, oh, I'm going to act the same whether it's an arena or five people in the crowd, you should be acting different if it's five you people really, versus really an arena. Should be. Oh, yeah. Are you going to talk the same to a single person or a group of two people or a group of ten people? Because then that just makes me think you're not actually looking at the people you're talking to. You're talking the lines you've rehearsed. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's a script at that point. Well, either a which, no matter what the vibe is, the interaction should be like a feedback loop between you and the and whoever's in the audience. You know, you at least with the music that I make, I find it almost easier to vibe with just a handful of people or rather it feels more unnatural when it, it's a bigger group of people trying to talk to them because after that it just kind of like yeah I'm just kind of speaking out there you know but either way it's that's just a lesson to learn to get to the point where you can really feel everybody and know that everybody's feeling you and and let that be a like I said a feedback loop you're feeling them feeling you feeling them feeling you you know, and everybody just walks out feeling real good. Well, I will say specifically with your kind of music, I mean, that's called knowing what your demographic and the ideal size is. Like, I don't think I'd like doing an arena tour, even though I'd love to, but that's not my ideal setting. Like, I have the size group for a crowd I want to play for in my head already, and that's the peak crowd I want to play for. 
Whereas you were just saying, you know the crowd you want to play for. And you know what works best with what you can do. Yeah, three people. <laughs> it's just like, look at what you can actually do and plan for the thing you want to do and then react for the place you're at. I've had shows where like jumping up and down to me has felt stupid. And so I just kind of stopped as much because it wasn't the crowd or environment or the setting for it. So it's a case of this area feels they'd rather see this type energy. And so you got to change. Like, you don't want to see Flea doing a bass solo by himself, jumping up and down and running back and forth. No, you want to see him in his own. Right. Again, it's like, well, everything that you're going to do, in addition to the music, has to back up the music. Mm. The music is the biggest thing. Yeah. That's why they're there. So you got to play the vibe, but it's got to play into the music to be as good as it has to be. And that's why tone of voice is such a big concern. Um, when you're getting started as an artist, that's, I think, one of the first things you should be thinking about is, what is my personality? How do I talk to people in a way that enhances the music and doesn't take away from it? This is like a big complaint I specifically have about metal bands is they'll talk like punk bands. The ethos of metal, as we've talked about, is more than human. It's grand, it's technical mastery, it's extreme, but the whole energy of it is theatrical, over the top, more than human. If you try to appear down to earth, it's going to break the immersion when you're watching people do inhuman feats on stage. Mm-hmm. A lot of the time it just comes across as cheesy. Whereas punk, I mean, the attitude is populist. Anyone on stage can hop up and do this. And so you see punk bands acting foolish. Is it acting foolish or acting a fool is the worst one? Acting a fool just means shenanigans. All right, acting yeah. foolish means... I was acting a fool last night. It was crazy. Like that. Acting a fool versus acting foolish to me is, is like Bob Dylan versus Donovan. <laughs> and I, I don't know. That, I think that gets the point across. <laughs> My main thing is you don't want to... With metal, as Connor said, a genre that's all about intense feelings and this grandeur energy. Like, just think of any of the classic metal bands. They haven't looked like your dad's playing on stage. If you as a metal band walk on stage and I can think with everything you're doing and looking and moves you're doing, like, that's my dad up there back when he was that age. Like King Crimson. Then I... Yeah, there's no point. <laughs> yeah. Don't 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 wear a t-shirt of another band. Don't make me think of another band while I'm watching you guys. That's like that's like a Gatorade athlete like drinking two Red Bulls as he's accepting a thing. Like you're not that's not your brand. That's not the sponsorship you're going for here. That's not what you want people to think about. Well, here's the thing. If you were playing a grand stage, I feel like it is acceptable to wear another band's t-shirt, either in an ironic sense or in a boosting the underground sense. Only if it's an aesthetic band. Well, yeah. yeah. I don't care how much I love the local scene. If I'm playing at an arena and a band's t-shirt looks like every other band's t-shirt... I'm not touching your thing no matter how much I love you as a person or as a band. That's the thing. Most band shirts are ugly. They are. Give me that white print with a logo design on black shirt. Like, I can't tell the difference between the bands. If it's a decision that reinforces the music, go for it. If you're Alpha Andromeda and it's your brands, then yeah, play extreme metal wearing Hawaiian tees. Mm-hmm. If there's only one person playing in the band wearing a Hawaiian tee... There's two people wearing band shirts, one person wearing a wife beater. And there's no, like, larger brand image that it's reinforcing. I'm just going to think they were lazy. I'm going to think they it's don't like care no how they dress. to each other. None of them asks, like, what time do we get there for load in? No one really asked what the set list was before the day of. Like, you didn't talk to each other on any aspect. It's like the whole um, people saying, oh, this artist is so picky. They said only give me blue M&Ms in their um, request sheet. Yeah, they requested only blue M&Ms because if you fill that request out out of all their necessities with like stage setup, their wiring needs, their power drops, their all this, 
if you get them blue M&Ms, you know the rest of your stuff is going to be on point. That's just to check to make sure. They're paying attention. Yeah, the local crew was on their on their game. It's not because they need blue M&Ms. It's because just so they know when they show up, like, hey, okay, the blue M&Ms are here. Therefore, my power drop is going to be on stage where I need it. It's a limit test. It shows care for attention to detail. And in the same way, your shirts that you wear together show an attention to your aesthetic and your care for presentation. You didn't just say, okay, everybody just show up at the place. You said, okay, guys, we're doing this. We're doing this. The same can be said of your banter on stage. I mean, you can choose any sort of tone of voice. You can be casual. You can be witty. You can be quiet and subdued. As long as it feels like there's a vision behind it, then the audience is going to trust you. They're going to trust your creative vision. <laughs> and they're going to accept anything that like, they're at first sketchy about musically. They're more likely to buy it and like follow you as you go versus turn off, tune out. Yeah, it makes it so if you hear like random feedback, you're going to first interpret it as, oh, this is like a feedback solo. And then maybe you might think, oh, wait, no, that's something's messing up. But yeah, you want the benefit of the doubt. And there's so many ways you can provide the benefit of the doubt that people just blatantly ignore and just say, yeah, no, we're just going to be ourselves on stage. Dog, unless you have a hundred thousand friends right now, don't be yourself on stage. No one wants to see you on stage. They want to see insert band name here. Exactly. You don't need to make music if you want people to just see you on stage. You need to give something to them. You got to know yourself well enough. You need to know yourself. And I mean, this is kind of the truth of being an entertainer. You need to portray a caricature of yourself because there's a lot of depth to human beings. There's a lot of nuance, different angles. You can get to know someone over the course of 10, 20, 30 years and learn new things every day, but you don't have that time on stage. Mm -hmm. You need to show them just the parts of yourself that are going to catch their attention so that they want to get to know you. They want to get to know your music. And that includes the faults as well. A lot of people get caught up on the semi-godly figure that they want to portray on stage, and that's not what folks come to see half the time. They want to see a human who is portraying what they believe through music. I feel like there's some contradicting points happening because it's like in the context of metal, I want to see the super God on stage, you know? This is fair, this is fair. I don't want to see these down to earth dudes, you know? And it's, well, the thing is with a lot of, a lot of metal heads, great musicians, bad actors, you know, because you know metalheads, they're the sweetest dudes. I love metalheads, but you can't be that sweet, cuddly guy I want to hug when you go up on stage playing this angry, rip my face off music. Everybody has their sweet metalhead friend. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, like the archetype of cuddly metal dude right now is Will Ramos. He's like famously just a cool dude and makes the most absurd, inhuman noises with his mouth. But on stage, granted, I haven't been to a concert, I can't say if like his banter's just really cringe, but at the very least, the whole band's wearing black button-downs, just dark clothes. It doesn't scream normal person, it screams professional musician doing professional music shit. Would anybody go watch a circus performer do the same act in normal clothes? You want me to go like walk out in cargo pants and a t-shirt and go do an act? No, clowns dress like clowns for a reason. Jugglers dress in juggling outfits. There's a reason their circus people dress how they do, and it's because they don't want any aspect once you enter the big top to remind you of the outside world. So many people forget about how this is an experience, this is an entertainment thing. There's a reason venues are dark. There's a reason venues are normally gritty. Like, they could clean those. Like, that's not a hard thing. They choose to have it that way. If you're a performer, you dress because you're performing to give what the audience needs. I strongly dislike when people just say, ah, no, I'm not going to do that because I want to be the real me on stage. The real you doesn't exist. You don't even know who that is yet. The real you is whatever you decide it's going to be for that night. Yeah, the real you is going to change a whole lot when you're drunk. In your dreams, you're going to be a different person. When you start tearing a tasty lick on it, like, if you still feel like a dude while running some hard riffs, like, I'm more scared of you like that. <laughs>